I think we can move to our next speaker. Tomasz Turan is a member of the Hungarian Academy, a, Syrian, a serious a senior research fellow at the Utvesh Loral Research Network, the Institute for Minority Studies, and teaches rabbinic literature at Utvesh Loral University, which is the university with which Goldsia was associated, as we learned yesterday, and mentioned this earlier today. His fields of interest include rabbinic literature, the history of the Hebrew book, and the history of Judaic scholarship in Hungary. His talk is entitled, From the Mouth of Scholars and Not from Books, Goldsia, the Scandinavian School, and the Study of Orality in Ancient Judaism. Please go ahead. So let me start by saying that Goldsia was an emotional man, and he had very strong loyalties towards both Hungary and Judaism and the Jewish people. So I think it, was, it is most appropriate that the Hungarian uh, and the Israeli academies of science uh, collaborated and joined efforts in or organizing this pair of conferences. <clears throat> and of course, I'm uh, very thankful for the organizers and, and uh, to Professor Johannan Friedman in particular for allowing me to, to speak here about uh, some lesser known aspects of Gauthier's uh, contributions and in particular indirect contributions to Jewish scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, Gauthier's relationship with Judaic scholarship has not, was not a happy marriage. In fact, it was not a marriage at all. Whoever reads Goldziher's main diary will recognize that it was a relatively brief affair, which quickly turned sour and deteriorated into squabbles. Nevertheless, the former lovers kept to be in contact and continued a convolute relationship. Judaic scholarship is a major context and a mean meaningful subtext of his oeuvre, and his contributions to this field remained significant. Part of these contributions are readily available in papers and books devoted wholly or partly to Ju Judaic themes, and in particular to Jewish Islamic comparative studies. Another part is hiding in hundreds of his remarks, most of them in compar of comparative nature between Judaism and Islam, and mostly scattered in footnotes. My talk is devoted to a third dimension of Gauthier's contribution to Judaic studies, to his impact on the study of ancient Jewish literature. Earlier forays notwithstanding, from the last decades of the 19th century, we witness an accelerated folkloristic or anthropological turn in approaching ancient religions and cultures and the formation of their literatures and canonical documents. This development went hand in hand with the gradual emancipation of the study of religion or history of religions, later called comparative religion or phenomenology of religion, from being a handmaid of theology into an independent academic discipline. In both developments, Scandinavian countries played a crucial role with significant input from German scholarship in the first development and important Dutch and British input in the second. In both battlegrounds, we find Goldziher in the front line. As for ancient Jewish literature, the recognition that the formation of its classical works, the Bible, the Mishnah, and other works of the oral law, can be understood only as some interplay between oral and written transmission, from the mouths of scholars and from books, gained gradually more and more acceptance after World War I. Compare the summary statements of Johannes Pedersen, the other protagonist of this talk, uh, in his uh, uh, the Arabic book, I'm quoting, oral transmission of the book, the Quran is meant, proceeds alongside the written. He writes about the Quran, and about exegesis, he remarks, he remarks that a written exposition is not regarded as independent mode of expression, but as a representation of oral communication. This novel insight on the nature of the dawn of ancient Jewish and other literatures 
went hand in hand with new understandings about how ancient religious cultures should be understood and described. In this talk, I will try to highlight Golzi has substantial, although barely known and mostly indirect contribution to this mentioned folkloristic term in the study of ancient Jewish literature in the mentioned two areas. First, concerning its transmission, and second, understanding the culture reflected in it. In a more biographic key, I will also venture to make some hypothetical remarks about what Jewish scholarship in this field would have gained if Godzi has relationship with it had not turned sour. Early 20th century biblical scholarship started to pay attention to oral transmission and to bring comparative material from other cultures. Especially Scandinavian scholarship showed much interest in this field from World War I times onwards. Its contributions are much better known than the interdisciplinary background which gave rise to its innovative approaches. In this context, ancient rabbinic culture was referred to only sporadically and relatively late, despite the fact that along with other literary cultures, the Jewish tradition reflected on phenomena related to oral transmission extensively with sophistication and yields much material on these issues since the earliest times. Behind the maxim or phrase uh, cited in the title of this talk, for example, so popular among medieval Jewish scholars, especially in Islamic lands, which says that knowledge should be acquired from the mouths of scholars and not from books, there is a long history of legal and non-legal Talmudic traditions, as well as classical philosophical wisdom. Remarkably, the phrase was also used, especially after the invention of printing, in the modified, from, in the modified form from the mouths of scholars and from books. It is noteworthy, therefore, that a cross-fertilization of the study of rabbinic literature and general studies in orality started only a few decades ago. Since then, one finds in works on the history of rabbinic literature scattered references, howbeit cursory, to parallels from other cultures, including Near Eastern ones. Decisive impulses for this change came, it seems, from a variety of disciplines. The true extent to which research, and Scandinavian research in particular, in these cultures and disciplines influenced the biblical and rabbinic fields deserves closer examination. <clears throat> Goldziha's work had a share in these de research developments at an early stage. His entire oeuvre from the beginnings shows how distinct interest in oral modes of expression in all the cultures and religions that he studied and investigated. I mean by this not only the oral transmission of legal and literary traditions, but also verbal rituals such as prayer, vows, spells, etc. Having much affinity for ethnology and folklore and the first-hand intimate knowledge of Judaism and Islam from his home, from his study tour, and from his diverse academic studies, from the mouths of scholars and from books, Golzi had became a comparatist and an early advocate of the history of religion's approach. In this talk, I wish to trace the interesting interplay between Islamic and Jewish studies in the study of orality and Godzia's share in it. I will try to assess Godzia's contribution and the contribution of Arabic Islamic studies in general to the turn to orality or oral tradition in biblical and rabbinic literatures in subsequent scholarship, first and foremost through the mediation of Scandinavian scholars. Goldziher and his student for a few months, Johannes Pedersen, will be in the focus of the discussion, not because there was a particularly strong teacher-discipline relationship between the two, but because important schools and research trends interacted with each other in their relationship. Uh, so that is the general structure of the talk, and I am <clears throat> Uh, I'm moving on to the second part uh, on Golzi has interest in folklore, oral, and written transmission. Uh, Golzi has interest in folklore was manifest from the earliest stages of his academic development. 
Although this interest was supported by emerging academic disciplines, disciplines from a variety of directions, Golzi has affinity and, and, and enthusiasm for folkloristic phenomena was independent and genuine. I survey below three less known but significant manifestations of this interest from his early publications, in addition to a programmatic statement by his disciple Martin Schreiner from their correspondence inspired by Goldziher. <clears throat> The first example concerns uh, Goldziher's discovery of folklore. Goldziher was a 19 years old student at Berlin University when he published his first paper on the Bible. In this paper, published in Hungarian in 1869, he interpreted two biblical passages in light of what he learned from Johann Gottfried Wettstein's lectures in Berlin on Bedouin life. These pieces of information were apparently not used by Wettstein, Wettstein himself to elucidate the biblical passages. The first of Golzi had two expositions. The longer one deals with the Bilam story. Golzi reads the story and defines its setting in life, sits in Leben, in light of the fact that when two Bedouin tribes are engaged in war, hostilities are started and finished by poetry. This was a quotation from Goldziher. <clears throat> Hostilities are started and finished by poetry. That is to say, warring tribes usually recruited one of their expert poets or hired one from elsewhere to praise the tribe and its bravery and to scorn and intimidate the enemy. Acquaintance with this ancient Bedouin practice of poetic martial propaganda, still traceable in contemporary Islamic societies, I think, was the starting point of Golziher's lifelong occupation with hijab poetry and pre-Islamic Arabic poetry in general. For Golziher, this was not a mere scholarly pursuit. It was a veritable fascination with the subject, enhanced by the fact that Parashat Bilam was Golziher's weekly portion in his bar mitzvah ceremony. He was attached with pleasant memories to this event, which carried much significance for him all through his life. In Berlin, Goldziher discovered folklore. A major methodological lesson that he derived from Wettstein's lectures was that Bedouin lifestyle is so conservative that its contemporary observance potentially yields precious information about ancient nomadic Bedouin Israelite life too. The second example concerns Gozia's discovery of the problem of written versus oral transmission. Through the ages, ancient sacred literatures were transmitted in three modes of communication, orally, in handwriting, and in print. Once available, these media, these modes of transmission did not exclude each other, but were used simultaneously in different functions and contexts. As mentioned above, the dictum or maxim cited in the title of the present talk was also used, especially after the invention of printing, in the form from the mouths of scholars and from books. Goldziher was exposed to the simultaneous existence of the mentioned three modes of transmission in Judaism in various ways, but more directly and explicitly in Islam, especially during his studies at the Al-Azhar Academy in Cairo. He reflected on, on these experiences in his, um, um, in his report on the books brought from the Orient for the Hungarian Academy of Sciences written in 1874, less than a month after his return from his Oriental study tour. He expanded on how the spread of printing, originally considered a prohibited innovation in Islam, illustrates the necessity of religious development and how the writing down of tradition or traditions in Islam, which to him were originally meant to be transmitted orally, proves the same point. And between these historical explanations, he reported about what he himself saw in Al-Azhar, that while students followed the text expounded by the teacher from printed copies, the teachers themselves used only handwritten texts. Goziher did not pioneer, neither in the Judaic nor the Islamic context, 
in investigating the role of oral and written transmission in the evolution of the dual written and oral law. Nevertheless, he was the first to put this problem into a wider context, into an Arabic, Islamic, and Judaic comparative perspective from various vantage points, literary, historical, folkloristic, and ideological. Golziad's views fluctuated over time concerning the question whether traditions indeed were originally meant to be transmitted orally in Judaism and Islam, to what extent this was a consensual view in the early periods in these respective cultures, and what was the historical nature of the alleged similarity between the Judaic and Islamic duality between written and non-written law. Ideologically, however, he maintained quite consistently that the reason behind the opposition to writing down traditions in both cultures was to preserve the freedom of legal scholars in developing norms and adjudicating matters. Um, the third example has something to do with folklore and the transmission of folk literature. In a book review published in 1881 on the development of comparative mythology, Gozi had praised the British scholar George William Cox and his books on comparative mythology published in 1870 and 1881 for the attention paid to popular traditions, Cox's favorite term, for, distinct, for distinguishing it from mythology proper and for his attention given to epic literature and to, and to cite Gozia's terminology, oral traditions in his researches. As Gozia had cites Cox's view approvingly, part of these folk legends and narrative oral traditions that circulate even today in Germany, Norway, or India, hark back to hundreds of years before the common era. And fourth, finally, let us listen to echoes of Godzihad's work on Hadith from a rabbinic angle, preserved in a letter by Martin Schleiner, a graduate of the rabbinical seminary of Budapest and one of Godzihad's outstanding disciples. The letter I'm going to quote was written by Schreiner to his mentor, Goldziher, while the former, Schreiner, prepared the index to the second volume of the letters, Muhammadanische Studien, in 1890. I'm quoting. Uh, if Jewish theologians would read it, the second volume of Muhammadanische Studien, it would perhaps work its way back on the study of Jewish tradition, although there are huge differences between the notions of tradition in the two religions. Judaism was saved from falsifications of tradition in Islam by the Deuteronomium chapter 17, verse 11, which proved authority for oral Torah without Isnad. The remarks on Hadith and Sunnah in the book led me to investigate the question to what extent carriers of the Jewish oral law were aware that what they say is novel." End of quote. Schreiner continues his letter by presenting some relevant rabbinic traditions and concepts. It is interesting that in contrasting the rabbinic notions of authenticity of traditions with the Islamic concept of Isnad, Schreiner cites the biblical verse from Deuteronomium that says, you shall act in accordance with the instructions given you and the ruling handed down to you. You must not deviate from the verdict that they announce to you either to the right or to the left. This verse is the locus classicus in defining the collective authority of the rabbis and commanding obedience to it. Schreiner's comparison between Hadith and the parallel, rabbinics, uh, parallel rabbinic concepts also deserves at attention. The most significant element, uh, element in Schreiner's cited remarks, however, is his general recognition of the importance of the comparative investigation into the nature of the oral tradition in Judaism and Islam. This is an eminently interesting and important subject. Yet it must be added, and I can comment only uh, on the Judaic aspect, that our knowledge about some basic issues of the Jewish oral law or oral tradition is currently very limited, 
For instance, it is unclear concerning most of the early rabbinic Tanaitic works of legal and non-legal nature, what was the historical significance of the fact that part of the traditions are cited anonymously, another part is attributed to named rabbis, and the rest are quoted in the name of the sages in, in general. Is the lack of attribution in a given traditional statement a result of the lack of information of authorship, or does it serve any redactorial purpose? The sages of the Amoraic period frequently tried to find named authorities behind statements cited anonymously in Tanaitic sources. But these efforts were based precisely on their understanding that anonymous statements usually have greater authority than attributed ones. The compilers or redactors of ancient rabbinic works were uh, certainly more interested in the truth of traditional statements than in their authorship, because to their mind, this truth was not inherently dependent on the authorship of a given statement or the reliability of its transmission. We have limited knowledge about the rules and significance of attributions in the rabbinic corpus. Gozier also did not have crystallized views on these issues, and I think this was the one reason for the fluctuation of his views on the structural and historical relationship between Sunnah and Hadith and or Jewish oral law. According to an important and illuminating Talmudic dictum, I'm quoting, even that which an accomplished disciple will one day teach before his master was already revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai. Uh, Golzi had cited this saying in his Vorlesungen über den Islam, as a Jewish parallel to Islamic traditions, according to which Muhammad assured his followers that every saying in accordance with the Quran is his, whether or not he said it, and whatever is rightly spoken was spoken by him. Gozi had, uh, had a complex policy, especially in discussing Islamic law and jurisprudence of citing Jewish parallels or glossing over them. The mentioned context is certainly among the weightiest issues with regard to source criticism to which he brought a Jewish parallel. However, here again, besides highlighting the achronic aspect of the oral law and the sunnah and other substantial structural similarities, one finds significant differences between the mentioned Jewish and Islamic traditions. For example, in the role that Moses and Muhammad plays in them respectively. Gozia did not go into the details of this parallel. And we have no way of knowing whether he drew any conclusion from this Talmudic source or from other sources about the nature and authenticity of traditions that make up Jewish oral law. <clears throat> Third part, rabbinic literature and, and biblical research, verb, verbal rituals, oral tradition and transmission, Scandinavian and other scholars. The pioneering work of Hermann Gunkel in biblical form criticism and in the comparative study of Near Eastern mythology and religion, focusing on the biblical world, deeply influenced all subsequent research in the mentioned areas. In biblical research and in the history of religion, Scandinavian scholarship also developed innovative approaches in the second third of the 20th century. There was actually a significant overlap there between scholars working in the two respective fields. Ethnology and folklore was an important factor in opening up this new perspective, in the case of Gunkel as well as in the case of Scandinavian scholars, who started collected folk poetry and fairy tales as early as the beginning of the 19th century, partly under the influence of the Brothers Grimm. Later, Gozia's oeuvre became, became an important source of inspiration for Scandinavian scholars, as I will try to show below, paying special attention to Johannes Pedersen's relationship to Gozia. Besides his major studies on the origins of uh, Hadith, on pre-Islamic Arabic poetry and the poet prophet diviner, much of Golzihar's work, as noted above, dealt with verbal rituals, speech acts, and oral transmission in Islamic or Jewish contexts, or both, prayer, magical formulas, oaths, etc. 
these works started to draw attention in biblical research from the beginning of the, of the 20th century, particularly in Scandinavia. In Scandinavian countries, we see a strong emphasis on Hebrew and Arabic in Semitic philology, and between biblical and Islamic research, see, for example, uh, here is a list. Uh, for example, Franz Buhl, Pedersen, Thor, Andre, Henrik Samuel Newberg, Harris Birkeland, and Helmer Ring Ringgren. The study of Iranian cultures and religions also played an important part among Scandinavian Semitists. In the study of biblical religion and religion in general, an anti-evolutionist stance was prevalent and approaches of comparative religion was preferred over theology. Henrik Samuel Newberg, professor of Semitic studies, but chiefly an Iranist in Uppsala, turned to oriental literatures, first and foremost to holy books of Iranian religions and Islam, to discover the significance of the oral transmission in their formation, even after they were committed to writing and parallel to their use in some circles in limited ways. Later on, he stressed how much his insights were dependent on his Islamic studies. Haris Birkeland, professor of Semitic languages in Oslo, in 1938 cited Newberg's insights, surveyed the role of orality in the formation of the Quran text, and using Gozihad's work in the formation of Hadith. In discussing prophetic literature, he emphasized that its written formation fixed an oral text and made reference to the Quran, to Hadith, and to the Talmudim. Subsequently, severe criticism were raised from within Scandinavian circles by Geo Wiedengren, for example, against radical forms of the theory of oral transmission of the Hebrew Bible, and the theory has been ignored altogether in many segments of biblical scholarship worldwide, particularly in Germany. Later, more moderate conclusions on the role of oral transmissions were reached by Scandinavian scholars with regard to the Bible, and some of their insights started to gain wider acceptance. Three quite unduly forgotten publications of Solomon Gantz on orality in ancient and medieval literatures put the question of orality for the first time in a wide comparative context. Gantz, with his traditionalist upbringing and Talmudic background, also came to this subject from an Islamist perspective. His doctoral thesis, submitted in 1813, dealt with pre-Islamic Arab Arabic poetry. One of his lasting achievements was to collect and interpret data on orality from the Bible itself. In his relevant article, as in his other articles, parallels from Arabic Islamic culture abound and dominate the panorama. At some places, he refers to Gozier directly. At other places, he refers to authors who rely on Gozier's work. Gantz's article propounds the thesis that in the first temple period, the written Torah was not widely circulated and accessed. It was deposited in the temple and was publicized only in Ezra's times. <clears throat> Gantz and other wor others' work could have filled a gap in the study of rabbinic li literature, but this did not happen for a long time. The question whether the Mishnah was written down when it was finally redacted in the early third uh, century occupied the minds of numerous rabbinic authorities since Gaonic times and numerous modern scholars of the Wissenschaft des Judentums. In the mid 20th century, both Jakob Nahum Epstein and Shaul Lieberman, the greatest scholars of Talmudic literature in the 20th century, made independent research on this question. With different methods, they reached partly similar conclusions. The study of the Mishnah remained basically oral, assisted by Tanaim, expert reciters and tradents, call them living books, for many centuries. And even, as Epstein posits, the writing down, even if 
uh, Epstein posits uh, the writing down of the Mishnah and other collections of rabbinic law started at very early stages. These written copies were meant for occasional and private use and were not published or circulated as textbooks. Thus, instead of earlier categorical answers to the question, if and when the Mishnah was written down, these two scholars of offered for the first time quantitative and qualitative functional distinctions in elucidating rather than solving the problem. Similar distinctions or models were offered not only by Gantz, but already by Alois Sprenger about 80 years before, who clearly distinguished between private notes and authorized books for public use in discussing the writing down of hadiths, and also by Goldziher, who elaborated on Sprenger's distinction. Epstein, and particularly Lieberman, used Greek and Latin sources, and the distinction between hypomnemata and syngamma, private notes, and the book proper. However, in their valuable researches, all oriental comparative material and research, whether by Goldziher, Gantz, Scandinavian scholars, or others, were ignored. It was largely through the mediation of Scandinavian scholarship that Jewish studies and Jewish scholars took up the problem of oral transmission in wider perspectives, including Oriental ones. The most important agent of that latter development was the Uppsala New Testament scholar Birger Gerhardson's memory and manuscript, oral, oral tradition and written transmission in rabbinic Judaism and early Christianity, published in 1961. In the following decades, a Jewish scholarship became engaged with the problem of oral transmission only in the context of classical Talmudic literature. Dealing with the an analogous questions concerning the Bible was left to others due to deep-seated reservations concerning critical Bible scholarship and Pentateuchal scholarship in particular. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, moving forward to the fourth uh, part, Goziher, Pedersen, and the Scandinavian school. Johannes Pedersen, um, who was born in 1883 and died in 1977, as yes, you have it on the slide, primarily an Arabist and a Hebraist, was appointed in 1916 as lecturer of the Bible at the University of Copenhagen. And six years later, in 1922, he succeeded there Franz Buhl, his teacher as professor of Semitic philology. Pedersen is credited with having been one of the founders of the Scandinavian School of, uh, of Biblical Research. Despite the diversity of scholarly views that members of this school advocated and represented, they had much in common. These can be summarized broadly in three sets of issues in their positive and negative aspects. One, the emphasis on oral transmission in the formation of Old Testament traditions and strong skepticism towards literary and textual criticism. Second, an interest in literature, religion, psychology, and popular mentality as integrated expressions of a given culture with deep reservations about overarching evolutionistic historical models and theological schematizations. And third, an interest in the cultic background of various biblical genres, the sacred, sacred kingship pattern in Near Eastern religions, and an affinity with the so-called myth and ritual school. As this brief characterization shows, this school evolved through a distinctly polemic dialogue with prevalent German approaches in uh, biblical scholarship, despite some important impulses from German scholars, first and foremost from Gunkel, among others. In all these di uh, research directions, the Scandinavian school received much inspiration from Goldziher too. 
either then neither used uh, neither used terminology like oral traditions nor did he apply widely tradition historical methods systematically in examining specific biblical text units but since the 18 uh, since the 1920s he pioneered in challenging literary source criticism and emphatically warned against reading and understanding biblical texts as literary creations, as reflections of conditions and ideas representing the time and place of their final literary formation, and neglecting the long prehistory of the core traditions behind them. In his doctoral thesis, Der Eid by den Semiten, The Oath Among the Semites, published in 1914, he analyzed some basic notions and institutions of the Semitic outlook and collective mind, not only oath, but also curse and the inherent connection between the two. In all these discussions, Gozi has works on pre-Islamic Arabic poetry and other topics played a central role, and Pedersen referred to them dozens of times. Although Pedersen did not elaborate on his motives for working on this project, and in the introduction of the book or elsewhere, he did not give more credit to Goldziher than to his other teachers, Goldziher's influence is obvious in conceiving Pedersen work, Pedersen's work, and especially in providing groundwork for it. <clears throat> Pedersen's magnum opus, titled Israel, Its Life and Culture, published originally in Danish in two parts in uh, 1920 and 34, especially its first volume was an organic outgrowth of his work on oath in the Judaic segment of the Semitic orbit. Oath and covenant played again a central role in this book with attendant analysis of blessing and curse, along with themes such as honor and shame family and town population as psychic units, intergenerational bonds, friendship, war, etc. In short, the whole gamut of Israeli social and religious life was presented. Pedersen's letter to Goldziher attest in the biographical, uh, in the biographical dimension too that this seminal book was a natural extension of Pedersen's work on the Semitic oath and that, this, that, that he started to make preparations for it already in 1913. Um, no. A few names of the Sand Scandinavian school. And here it is a postcard of uh, Godzia to Pedersen in which he acknowledges the receiving his book in the original Danish publication a year before his death in 1920, uh, apologizing about not uh, having, ab not being able to read fully the book because his Danish is quite poor, etc. So he received his reward for publishing in Hungarian. You know that um, and many of his colleagues complained uh, to him and after his death that he chose to publish some important, apparently important works in Hungary in a, in a godforsaken obscure language that no one is able to read and is, is not accessible to the scholarly world. So that was, that was also, so that was a sort of reward from him getting that Danish book. Pedersen's approach and thematic interests were in line with Gozia's ever-present interest in cultural anthropology and ethnopsychology. Having realized that the essence and function of pre-Islamic Arabic poetry performed and transmitted essentially orally for a period of time before committed to writing cannot be grasped well by literary methods and aesthetic criteria. Gozi had maintained in 1893 that the, be, I'm quoting, the beginnings of Arabic poetry pertain not so much to the history of literature than to ethnography, end of quote. Ethnography corresponds more or less to cultural anthropology in our present day taxonomies. 
There was a deep inner affinity between Peders and, and Golzihad's scholarly interests, and therefore it is clear that it was much more than a courtesy and rhetorical flourish when Peders opened his article published in the first Golzihad Festschrift, published in 1948, uh, as follows, uh, uh, quote, with the ancient Arabs and uh, the art of the spoken word played an overwhelming role. How strong was the power of the word had been pointed out by Golziher. It is important to add, however, that Wilhelm Peter Grönbech, philologist and professor of the history of religion at the University of Copenhagen, shaped Peter's and interest and approach apparently even more deeply than Golziher. In any case, orality in ancient Near Eastern religions and the role orality plays in the transmission of corresponding literatures, blessing and curse became central themes in subsequent Scandinavian scholarship. They remained central in the later work of Pedersen himself too, with frequent references to Golziher's works. Pedersen and Golziher corresponded since 1910. While working on his dissertation, and as the last stop in his study tour in Leipzig, Leiden, Paris, and Berlin, Pedersen spent three and a half months in 1912 studying with Golziher in Budapest. Um, I was told by uh, Professor Laszlo Marton Pakosdi, an eminent Protestant theologian, in Hungary, who knew, who knew, I think, personally, Peders and a number of other Scandinavian scholars, that in preparation for his studies with Golziher in Budapest, Peders and also learned Hungarian at some level. Uh, in uh, 1912, uh, finally, uh, a few months after uh, studying with Golziher, Peter then submitted his Habilitation Schrift, uh, and their correspondence provides further information on uh, Golziher's influence and, uh, and their relationship. Uh, I'm not quoting, I'm not bringing this correspondence here. From Golziher's diary, we know that he was interested in the oath of Arabic, in the, in the oath in Arabic culture, assembled much material already by 1902, and published, pub, planned to publish a work on it as the third volume of his Abhandlungen zur Arabischen Philologie. These facts are touched upon in the Golziher Pedersen correspondence too. Golziher's plan, however, was never realized. Pedersen work, Pedersen's work was probably another reason for abandoning this project. A letter of Pedersen after Golziher's death to Golziher's son suggests that the former's work on oath may not have been the decisive factor that prevented Golziher from compiling uh, his work on oath. In any case, Golziher published numerous articles related to this theme. Like Golziher, Pedersen became fascinated with Islam as a culture of learning, as he found in Al-Ashar in Cairo. Research into the ancient Jewish mind was conducted for a long time in isolating theology and religion from other spheres of life, and even these were investigated through the lens of Christian theological concepts. Pedersen was not interested in universalistic, supersessionist, or evolutionist approaches to biblical or Jewish religion. He advocated looking into particularities of Israelite life and culture in its own terms. Based on its program, blessing and curse, honor and shame, etc., it seems to be appropriate to characterize his book on Israel's life and culture as belonging to historical, cultural, anthropology, and ethnopsychology. Concluding remarks, I don't know where I stand vis-a-vis -vis the timeline and the time frame. It's okay. okay. <clears throat> uh, one, I have three concluding sets of remarks. Uh, the first is, both Goldziher and Pedersen were outstanding Semitic philologists who, however, were not ready to miss the forest for the trees. 
grand evolutionistic historical and theological schemes started to lose ground in the second half of the 19th century in the study of Near Eastern cultures too, parallel to the emergence of a number of disciplines. In their respective generations, both scholars pioneered in opening their field. Golzi had in Islamology, Peders and mostly in biblical studies, to new perspectives such as ethnography, ethnopsychology, folklore, and cultural anthropology. <clears throat> Second, besides Gunkel and Grönberg, Goldziar also had his share in shaping the approaches characteristic of Scandinavian research on ancient Judaism and in shaping modern research into religion and tradition criticism, particularly of the Hebrew Bible. In the 20th century, we observe a certain methodological convergence between research into the written law, the Bible, and the oral law, Talmudic Midrashic literature. That is to say, the phenomenology of oral transmission started to make inroads to the study of the Bible, and textual criticism conquered the study of rabbinic literature. After World War I, we see another cross-fertilization, this time between scholarship on Islam and Judaism. In his obituary on Golziher, Pedersen remarked that Golziher applied biblical source criticism to Hadith. It is probably no less justified to look at things the other way around and to see in Scandinavian scholarship on ancient Judaism the transfer and consolidation of approaches developed also by Goldziher in the field of Arabic Islamic studies that were inspired by ethnopsychology and folklore. Goldziher was among the first to explore oral and other popular forms of culture in Islamic and pre-Islamic societies and developed an integrated view uh, about the cultural and religious history and phenomenology of Islam. Moreover, beyond biblical source criticism mentioned by Pedersen, Goziher applied to Sunnah and Hadith also the 19th century agenda of research on Jewish oral law. Thus, we are witness, to use a linguistic term, to a reborrowing process. Golzi had pioneered in developing and transferring methods of research of ancient Jewish literature into Arabic Islamic studies. His approaches made their way back to biblical research and the study of rabbinic literature, particularly in Scandinavia. And from Scandinavia, these studies generated primarily through Gerhard's own study related to the New Testament, renewed interest in Judaic scholarship in orality in rabbinic literature. The third and final <clears throat> uh, uh, concluding remark. This reborrowing or detour leads us to the barren yet natural question what would have Gozi had accomplished had the center of gravity of his research remained in Judaic scholarship? Put it another way, if Gozi had woke from his slumber, how would he relate to the mentioned developments? implications of a folkloristic term in the study of orality in ancient Judaism. I guess he would read Pedersen's uh, Israel with enthusiasm. That work was a close approximation of Goldziher's programmatic concept of cultural history applied onto the biblical world. As for oral traditions in biblical research, he would read it with much interest. He would recognize it as quite a direct continuation of his research in comparative mythology. And with regard to orality in the formation of rabbinic literature, he would follow also this theme with strong interest. However, his limited proficiency in rabbinic sources did not really allow him to form an independent opinion on this issue and we have no clue whether he would project a strongly critical attitude to the authenticity of rabbinic sources, similar to what he developed for Sunnah or not, con discerning significant differences like Martin Schreiner did between Sunnah and rabbinic tradition. The problem of authenticity, not only in the literary historical sense, but as a religious aesthetic, ultimately folkloristic problem, remained central in his complex relationship with Judaism and Islam, but this is another story. 
<clears throat> and I thank for your attention. Thank you very much for shedding light on some lesser known aspects of Gautier's work and particularly his connection with the Scandinavian school. Thank you, thanks very much.